I want all of us to look back. Why don't you look back? Look behind. What do you see there? Media booth. And there's an offering box. Imagine yourself right next to that offering box, leaning on the wall of media booth, folding his hands that Jesus is watching the people who come to that offering box and put whatever offerings and gifts to the Lord. If Jesus came this morning and that's exactly what I said, you will say, what? Jesus will do that? Not interested in coming instead of coming to the podium and to speak to us or give us a hug and, and talk with us. He'll be standing back there and watching people giving offerings and tidings. Or imagine I do that. On every Sunday during the offering time, I will go on the back and stand right next to the offering box and see what deacons and cell leaders and church members come with the offerings. Now, I cannot see through the envelopes by which Jesus can do. But 2,000 years ago, in the temple of God, that's exactly what Jesus did. Standing next to treasury box and observe God's people and how much they gave in that offering box. That was what Jesus did. And we wonder why would Jesus, the Messiah, would be interested in observing and watching who and how much people will give offerings to God. So this morning, we want to understand the motivation and heart of our Jesus. Why Jesus in the temple will linger nearby treasury box and watch how much and what kind of people will bring offerings to God. And he saw rich people giving little portions of their riches. And then he also saw poor widow giving two coins, two mites, and he knew that entire livelihood of hers was given into that treasury box. And that's what Jesus said. While rich people gave portions of their possessions and treasures, but this poor widow gave all she had. And that was the end of the story. Jesus is not guaranteeing her with the amazing promises of financial blessings upon her life. He just made a statement, and that's end of the story. Why would Jesus do that? And from this story, what can we learn about Jesus? What is God trying to tell us? That's what we are going to study this morning. So let's turn our Bible as we've been reading book of Luke. Let's turn our Bible to book of Luke chapter 21 verse 1 through 4 and let us alternate. This is a very short passage that we are going to read together. And he looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. And he said, surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all. For it's a poor all together. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Now, we want to read the book of Mark. It's there the same story, same event that happened in the book of Mark chapter 12, Verse 41 and 44. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much, 
Then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrants. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Surely I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Only two gospel stories records this event and this story. And from this story, we are going to learn why Jesus will have an interest in looking over treasury box upon offering box and observe and what kind of people and how much they gave to God as their gifts and their offerings. So first, Jesus is interested in that how much we give to God. Why? Why is Jesus interested in our offerings? Why is Jesus interested in our tidings and our gifts to God? Our monetary gift to the Lord. Now we wonder, Jesus does not need our money. Jesus does not need our gold or silver. He created everything in this universe. He himself created gold and silver. He doesn't need our money. He's all-powerful. For his work, he can do everything. But why? Why? Because according to what he also said to us, where our treasure is, our heart is also. That's why. When we give our monetary offerings to God, not only we give this money, but we are giving our heart to the Lord. And that's why. Because he loves us. And he wants to be loved by us as well. And without this monetary offering to the Lord, our expression of our love to God is not fully expressed and solidified. And that is why. And that's why he said in the book of Matthew, as we know, chapter 6 from verse 19, book of Matthew Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal and lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That means that Jesus is looking inside of your pockets. Jesus is looking into your credit card statement. Jesus is looking into Apple wallet. He's interested in how you allocate your expenditures, how you spend your money, and how much you give to the Lord. Because that's where your heart, your treasure is, your heart is. We cannot bypass that. When I do premarital counselings that I say to future couples, important concept, do not have a separate checking account. Because once you have a separate checking account or savings account and so forth, then you will never as couples be united together in your heart. Your hearts will never become mingled. Because where your treasure is, your heart is also. You have your treasure separately, and your wife also uses her income separately. Because treasures are separated, your hearts will never be combined together. So only have one checking joint account. And that's so important. As you know, money is one of five top reasons why people get divorced. And I know many, many young couples because both of them are working and they have their separate incomes and they tend to have separate checking accounts or savings accounts. In that marriage, you will never have a full unity. Your hearts combine them together. One of the reasons why in our children's departments and youth departments, 
And also, I recognize this even in our adult congregation. This miracle center, do you know why we lack ownership in this? Oftentimes, that we don't care whether coffee is spilled on the carpet. No one cares about washing it or cleaning it. That things are so messy here and there because here from this congregation, we didn't give offering to build this miracle center. KM congregation, they sold their possessions. They sold their houses. That's why our heart is not into this building. Because we didn't give offerings to this building. So when we give our money, when we give our possessions and treasures, our heart is there. And we not only express our love for that, whatever it may be, towards God, towards a building, towards a person, towards a missionary, whatever it may be. Not only it's a love and our heart to reside there, but also we gain ownership for it. That's why, one of the reasons why when we send out our EM missionaries, we can fully sponsor them financially, but we encourage them, have their friends, church members, relatives, family members support them financially because where their treasure is, their heart is also. Those are people who financially support missionaries most likely will fervently pray for them as well. That's why sometimes... The church can subsidize financially for certain program, certain event and retreat fully, but purposefully we require fees from the church congregants. Why? Because when they give their own money, they take more ownership. They have a more fervent desire to be blessed such through program. Do you know that? Money is second most referenced topic in the Bible. Money is mentioned more than 800 times in the Bible and including possessions more than 2,000 times. And when you look at everything around, even in this building, look at the painter, look at the carpet, look, look at this microphone, look at this podium, that money is infiltrated into every fabric of our life and society. Every single chair, there's a dollar sign there. Even inside a church, outside a church. And also this word, Satan is governing through the medium called money. And if we are really honest, no matter how holy you are, every one of us, we like extra money. That's how it is. But the love of money becomes evil. It's the root of every evil. But love itself is not evil. The love for money is evil. And Jesus, that's why among so many different idols, he will only choose money and said, you cannot serve two masters because you will either love one and hate the other. That's why when we love money, we cannot say we love God. It doesn't work like that. Polygamy is not working. The man who has multiple wives, he cannot love multiple wives. He may love one wife, the rest, concubines, are object of his sexual pleasure. Our heart is designed that way. We are only creature. We are not God. God can love multiple people Billions of people equally with the unchanging eternal love, without change of his level of love. But we are not God. But God created it in our hearts so that with a single mindedness, we can love God above anything else. That's why Jesus is interested in looking into offering box. Because that's our shared expression of love to God. That's why. That's why we cannot love God and money all together. So that's why it's every time we go offering, it is a sort of expression, more than this, I love you. That's our confession. Now, second reason 
Second thing that we can learn about Jesus while he was observing this treasury box is this. Jesus is not impressed with the amount we give, but percentage we give. There were rich people who are giving millions of dollars. The amount is enormous. But if he possesses a trillion dollars, that's nothing to him. A billionaire giving a million dollars as offering to God, God may not be impressed. However, this widow, he possessed only two mites. That was all she got for her rent money, food money, gas money, all everything. And she gave 100%. And that impressed Jesus Christ. So it's not about amount. It's about percentage. When we spend everything for ourselves, for our family, for my lust, for my pleasure, my gain, for my own entertainment, and we just give a change to God, that's what it means. That's expression of my present spirituality. That's how much I consider how important my God is. And I'm the master. I am narcissistically in love with me. And I care about me and not about God. Plain as that. Plain as that. One of the reasons why I know most people don't like to hear a message of love, even though it's a second most referenced topic in the Bible, is because you don't want me to talk about your lover. That's why. But the reason why I believe God convicted me to share this message again, because you remember, I talked about finance, a Christian stewardship, early part of this year. So personally, I'm not fond of it, but the reason why is this. I shared a couple Saturdays ago with the cell leaders I feel like I'm called to be a missionary to second generation, to English-speaking congregation. I grew up from KM. I inherited their spirituality that we must understand if we belong to this body, Grace Korean Church or JMI, Grace Ministries International, what God has given inheritance spiritually to this first generation that are three Three distinctive spirituality. First, they are praying generation. They are fervent and persistent in their prayers. You know, they are doing third round of thousand day early morning prayer. I cannot even bring that topic with us. We're not there yet. Thousand days, third round. By the grace of God, that's what God trained me. I don't know much. I don't know how to do much. I don't know even how to bowl anymore. <laughs> but one thing, God beats me continually is to be on my knees, to cry out unto God. And that's something God wants to impart, transfer to this generation, to this congregation. Because without prayer, we cannot do anything. The world mission, the fruit, more than millions of people's salvation, thousands and thousands of church plants globally, all began on their knees. That's why God sent me to this congregation, to deliver that spirituality so that you become praying generation. Secondly, from that first generation, they are so generous. Starting with a senior pastor, he had a business. He was well off. He sold everything and went to ministry. He sold his house. And because of that spirituality flew into the heart of the congregation, you will hear endless testimonies of first generation selling their houses, selling their refrigerators, selling their businesses. Even they they you will hear testimonies like they got the loan to start their business, but they gave this mission offering. And you may think that's illogical and crazy. Yes, they are crazy. 
And God used the craziness to bear such a fruit globally. So that's why that, those people who have a strong accent in their English, not only they are praying generation, but they are giving generation. And we, if we want to receive that torch, that DNA, we also must be giving generation. God accepted their generosity. God accepted their commitment. Because without giving our possession and treasure to God, we cannot commit. That's reality. We cannot commit. And God accepted their sacrifices. And thirdly, they did everything for world mission. This church exists for the sake of world mission. Take it. Receive it. Your heavenly rewards will be great. We need to understand what root this church has grown up to be. Yes, we need to serve community. Yes, we need to care for poor. We've been caring for poor in third countries, in many, many different countries. And instead of talking about it, if we really want to inherit that spirituality, that we must also become praying generation, giving generation, and going generation because they went. They didn't talk about evangelism on their chairs. They went. They went. So we want to be a such a generation. We want to be a praying generation. We want to be giving generation. And we want to be going generation. And that's why God sent me to this sanctuary, from that sanctuary. And as much as God allows me, that's what we are going to infuse in this body of Christ. By the grace of God, I believe for the fact this ministry is a probably one of the most praying ministry in America among English-speaking Korean-American churches. And by the grace of God, with a similar size of this congregation, we are giving more than four times of other EM ministries. Praise God. And by the grace of God, even though we are now large in the size of congregation, we are most ascending missionary ministry, I believe. Because even with the short missions before the pandemic, we have sent more than 50% of the entire congregation to at least one short mission trip. So this giving part, we don't overcome then we cannot receive that inheritance. But I believe God has been and God will work through us. Even more than what God has done through that previous generation. Amen? Because you are much more qualified, more educated, more experienced, speak perfect English, and you are in the mainstream to shake this nation, and the society. This nation, from the beginning, gave a 50% of church income for the world mission, saying we will die by doing world mission. As a local church, that's it, what it is. If you give a, more than 50% of church finance, you cannot do anything. That's why so many pastors, local pastors here, they were not compensated for month receiving eviction notices, but they were okay. Why they knew were suffering. We have a little bit different approach, but we are going there. Do you know why we are giving finance? To Israel. Because where our treasure is, our heart is also. By giving for the church of Jerusalem and Israel, our love for the people, our vision and ownership grows. That's why. It's not about just money thing. And of course, secondly, 
according to what God said to Abraham. He who blesses you, I will also bless. So many of our church members experience that blessing. There is a third reason why. Because that's a spiritual principle. If we read 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Apostle Paul is encouraging church in Corinth to collect the offerings for the churches in Jerusalem. Why? Because they recently went through famine and physically they are so suffering with the poverty. And he said, collect the offerings. Why? Because the churches in Macedonia, like the church in Philippi and Thessalonica, they collected the offerings for the church in Jerusalem. Do likewise. He was encouraging. Why? Because you are indebted by Jerusalem church spiritually. Because of the gospel, Messiah, the law, and God himself revealed through the people of Israel. So you are indebted to them spiritually. So now you repay them physically, materialistically, and financially. And that's a principle. And that's why on 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 8, Apostle Paul says it like this. Verse 8, I speak not by, oh sorry, by commandment that I'm testing sincerely of your love by the diligence of others. That means I'm testing your sincerity of God, love for God by offering. But past that, 14, verse 14, sorry. But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may supply their lack and their abundance may also supply your lack that there may be equality. What Apostle Paul is saying is you give them financial blessings to the church in, in Jerusalem because that's what they're lacking financially. But you Gentile church support them so that they may their abundance, their spiritual inheritance, their spiritual abundance may be returned back to you. So financially, spiritually, both the churches, Gentile church and Jerusalem church may be in equality. That's why. So there is a spiritual principle why we are giving the most finance to the churches in Israel. And God has been honoring that and God has been blessing that. And that's the same concept. Why? Because Jacob, he was second son. It was not his turn to receive that spiritual inheritance from his father Isaac. It was upon Esau. But what did he do? He prepared a savory food, meal, according to his father's liking financially, materialistically serving him and stored that spiritual blessing. That's exactly what we are going to do next year through the missions conference. We host them and serve them and fully sponsor them financially so that we may inherit and receive the spiritual blessings and spirituality that God so honored and used so powerfully that it may trigger down to this generation. So we become Praying generation, giving generation, going generation, and missional generation. So we, as a congregation, need to be fully awakened and understand what God is doing at this time. And it's exciting. And it's exciting. My challenge humbly is this to you. Those are people who have not given tithe, repent. Your love for God will never grow beyond your tithing. It won't. Simple as that. But those are people who have been faithfully giving tithe, I challenge you. For the poor, for the missions, for the gospel, for whatever. God's kingdom's needs. Expand it. Challenge it. And see it. I'm sharing this humbly by my own experience. This year we mark 56%. But each year our offerings has been increased as well as our expenditure for our family. It's amazing. Unsolicited 
paid it, offerings or whatever, however, I, don't, I cannot keep the track of it. It's so amazing. His faithfulness, the spiritual principle works. His promise works. If you give your land and forsake for my namesake and for my gospel's sake, here on earth you will be multiplied 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, experience it. It's not just letters in the Gospels. It's God's promise. You can prove it with your life, and you can testify how powerful, merciful our God is. So Jesus, knowing this is an expression of our love to God, so he observed the treasury box. Secondly, his interest in percentage, not much with the amount. And thirdly, this is what? the most important lesson we can learn from this story. That woman, unnamed poor widow, Jesus did not give her any promise. But can you imagine this poor widow being that society without husband? She will have such a hard time for daily survival, but she gave everything she got. That means tomorrow I can die. But I believe the reason why she was able to do that was she's giving because Jesus said it's her all livelihood. Her life has been attached to two mites and went inside treasure box. That treasure box became the heart of God himself. And she accepted it. And I believe we will find out when we go to heaven. After a story, if there was a movie made about the life of this poor widow, there would be an amazing story. That God fully taking care of her, blessing her, using her. And I'm eager to listen to her testimony, how her life had become after this offering. How can I be so sure about that? Because there are multiple promises of Jesus. May not be recorded in this story, but numerous places throughout the scriptures, as we know. When we give our life fully, surrendered to God, God becomes responsible. God will take care of us. No matter what. I know more than twice I talk about George Mueller from this podium. But every time I reread his story, it's so intriguing, so challenging, and inspiring. All of us know George Mueller, who was born in Germany, went to England as a missionary, took care of over 10,000 orphans during his lifetime. But he had amazing testimonies. In his prayer diary, and he's known as a man with uh, more than 10,000 answers to his uh, prayer. Some say 20,000. But we don't know his uh, friends that he had. How that was uh, motivated into the heart of George Mueller. He met a friend whose name was Henry Craig. This guy was hired by a family dentist as a tutor for the dentist's two sons. But this dentist got called by God to go to Baghdad as a missionary. And his name was Anthony Groves. And the way he went to Baghdad, he sold all his business, his houses. And also, he went to Baghdad with the empty hands, trusting that God will provide. That he literally believed that when Jesus called young rich ruler, you sell all your possessions and give to the poor and you follow me. And this tutor, Henry Craig, 
was so intrigued and challenged by it and shared this story with his friend, George Mueller. And he got so convicted and challenged by his lifestyle, he decided to do that. In fact, he ended up marrying the sister of Anthony Groves, Mary Groves. And according to some neighbors, this sister was more devout than her brother. And they were married, and they decided to do two things. First, they sold everything and decided to fully trust God. And secondly, they will not reveal their needs to the people, but only talk to God. Why would I say to servants when I can directly talk to their Lord? So he didn't reveal any needs in the family, in the ministry, to the people. He directly went to God. And people thought he was a foolish, hard-headed, and stubborn. But he confessed in his diary, the lifestyle that we take is so amazing that I'm finding God as tender care, loving God. Even with the minute needs of his children, he cares for that he is a truly prayer-answering God. And in no way, I will return back to my old lifestyle. What it means to give my heart to God and fully give up my life to the Lord, that he is invited to fully in my life and begins to lead. We envy about his testimony, how he was able to enjoy over 10,000 answers to his prayers. But we don't want to hear prior to receiving answers to his prayers what full commitment and surrender he offered to God. We don't like to hear. But that's our challenge. But that's our challenge. I don't know how it will look like in your life. Fully surrendering before God. I don't know why I didn't plan this. I realized in recent Sundays, I'm talking about women, numerous widows, and prostitutes. The women who are weaker vassals, unknown, ostracized, not bringing too much influences, but from the Bible, those who are weak are called to confound the strong. Those who are unknown are called to shame the known and the popular. Let us all rise. God loves us. He loves us so much. He doesn't want anything hindering our hearts fully devoted to him. Sometimes it's so ionic how our love is expressed by love, money. Because all of us as a Christians, even though we like money, deep inside, we do have this notion in regards to money. We think money is dirty.
that we think money is unholy. And it's really hard to accept this reality that money is the instrument of express, expressing our love to God. Not only to God, where we spend the money the most, that's where our heart is gravitated towards. That's how our love is. Those are people who buy and spend the money on buying the music and songs and to download physically in his phone. That's his love. Those are people who buy an expensive Wi-Fi router, amazing monitor, and pays monthly for the fees of high speed of internet and computer games. That's his love and her love. That we want to provide the best brand of clothes, everything best for our children. That's where our love is. Being frugal is healthy. It's a biblical. And God also encourages us to invest. That's a biblical. Not in the gambling way. But by fear that we become so stingy and rely upon our savings account or however we utilize our own finance how we manage it closely examine it you will be amazed and you will be able to recognize love of your life This is a short story. This unknown poor widow. I don't know how she can do it. We don't know whether she had a suicidal thoughts. We give this, I give this, and I die tomorrow. But there are multiple stories from the Bible. Another widow with her son, Zarephath. She had a last meal and she was going to eat together with her son and will die. But Eliza called her, prepare me a meal. Your bread and your oil will never run out until famine stops begins to rain and she did and God did according to what he promised her churches in Thessalonica were suffering persecution and poverty but with their willingness they began to give for the churches in Jerusalem and their faith has been Commended by Apostle Paul as we read his letters. As much as this is unpleasant, but that's spiritual principle and that's our reality. Where our treasure is, our heart is also.
Can we pray for three things? Lord, make us a praying generation. Lord, make us a giving generation. Lord, make us a going generation. Let's call his name and pray. One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for your grace. Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for this.